on uh, waiting for Godot. Now, you have uh, great anticipation regarding this play, I guess, and uh, I would uh, try to introduce this play to you in this lecture. So, uh, before talking about uh, the text itself, let's see what uh, Beckett used to say on uh, James Joyce, one of his contemporaries. So, Beckett says that Joyce is a superb manipulator of material, perhaps the greatest. And I'm directly reading this because uh, as my students, you know that uh, what actually was happening during the early 20th century and uh, then later in the mid 20th century. You know about James Joyce, you know about the mythic method that Joyce, Yeats and to some extent Eliot was, were trying to use. And then uh, you know about the modernist experiments, you know about the cultural ambience of the early 20th century and the mid 20th century. In the previous semester you studied that. Right? So directly I am going to the uh, field per se. So Joyce is a super manipulator of material, perhaps the greatest. And Beckett is talking about James Joyce, the author of a portrait of the artist as a young man, then Ulysses, then Finnegan's Wake. So Samuel Beckett, the author of Waiting for Godot, is talking about Joyce. And he says he was making words to do the absolute maximum of work. There isn't a syllable that's superfluous. The kind of work I do is one in which I am not master of my material. So now he is talking about himself. He is saying that, well, Joyce is a master of words. He's a master of material, of his material. He's a master of his content. But I, myself, Samuel Beckett, is, unlike Joyce, not a master of my material. The more Joyce knew, the more he could. He is tending towards omniscience and omnipotence as an artist. I am working with impotence, ignorance. I don't think impotence has been exploited in the past. I don't think impotence has been exploited in the past. I'm repeating this because this is a very, very important line, a very important sentence, a key sentence to understand Beckett's aesthetics and also his politics, art, uh, politics that revealed through his art. So he says that I'm going to explore impotence and ignorance, which were either to unexplode. So he is in this way, you can say, going completely towards different direction, different from the, the high modernist trends set by Eliot, Pound, Joyce, uh, Virginia Woolf and others. So for them, there was a uh, certain intellection which was going on, uh, manifested through art. In, in contrast to that, we have this Beckettian world you have, where you do not know anything at all. You do not actually have any power at all. So you are helpless, you are ignorant, you are impotent. And I don't think impotence has been exploited in the past. There seems to be a kind of aesthetic axiom that expression is achievement, must be an achievement. My little exploration is that whole zone of being that has always been set aside by artists as something unusable, as something by definition incompatible with art. So he is going to explore something which is usually incompatible with art. That is to say, art would always give you, by common parlance, art would always give you a knowledge, art would always give you certain kind of insights. Right, which you would use in your life, which would enable you to understand life in a better way. But for Beckett, it's not like that. He would tell you that, well, art means nothing. In fact, life means nothing. And if that is the case, then what should you do? When you realize that you can't do it, nothing. And that's why nothing happens in Waiting for Godot. Nobody comes, nobody goes, right? So Beckett, uh, on his selection of French, because uh, this uh, text was uh, first written in French, and as you know, it was premiered in Paris. So 
he selected French because the relative asceticism of French seemed more appropriate to the expression of being undeveloped, unsupported somewhere in the depths of the microcosm. So being unsupported, being undeveloped, he's always exploring these zones which are not so known to us and uh, they are not very strong. So if you think of modernist aesthetics, you would find that there is a certain amount of heroism in modernism. Though you, you may argue with me that, well, uh, so you can, you are saying that modernism uh, exploits uh, or explores heroism, modernism explore, explores knowledge, but also it, it is skeptical. It is uh, giving us figures like Prufrock who don't know where should I begin and how should you do this and, and where to go. This kind of uh, ignorance, this kind of confusion is there in modernism, in modernist aesthetics. However, I would say still in proof rock you would find certain kind of heroism the way in which he exists in this world the way in which he accepts his his uh, defeating state is heroic in nature at least he knows that he doesn't know at least he knows that uh, some way somewhere in the in the world uh, he would be able to listen to the mermaids think of the end of uh, the love song of j alfred proof rock and uh, probably uh, Prufrock realizes that, well, someday uh, there would be some kind of revelation on earth. So I, I would be able to hear the mermaid singing. And uh, this is how there is some hope in Prufrock. This is how there is some kind of uh, heroism in Prufrock. You can, you can argue in terms of James Joyce as well, where you have Leopold Bloom as Ulysses, right? Modern day Ulysses. He, he doesn't know anything. He, he, he has no control over his circumstances. And yet in Ulysses, you will find certain heroism because modern day Ulysses may not be an epic hero, may not be a great person, uh, may not be a perfectionist. However, the way in which he roams around, the way in which he deals with his everyday problems makes him heroic in nature. While uh, in Beckettian world, which in this sense is quite postmodernist nature, explores a world which is dark, not only dark, but it is inscrutable in nature. And hence, this very idea of inscrutability that you cannot question the world in which you reside makes you weak, makes you extremely vulnerable, helpless, right? And yet, there is a comic approach, there is comedy around it. Beckett is not being very, very sinister all the time. There are certain uh, places where you would find certain sinister undertones, certain serious undertones in the play. By and large, Waiting for Godot is a comedy. So in this way, he is exploring this unsupported, undeveloped zones. Right? And uh, see what Beckett was thinking in the 1930s. Right? Already modernism has made its ground and uh, people are talking about it. It has uh, passed, almost passed its, its prime. And for Beckett, ideas about comprehensiveness, omnipotence and unity were daily becoming less applicable, more alien. And his own experience was confirming an opposite set of facts about life and how a writer should deal with it in his books. Okay, so this was Beckett in the 1930s. And then in the 1940s, you would find that, uh, see, I'm skipping the detailed biography of Beckett because that is accessible to you. Uh, very easily you can read it uh, in several uh, from several sources so i am just highlighting the key points and he beckett discovers that there is an artistic voice and which is the voice of a non knower in the wake of the world wars in the wake of totalitarianism think of the context of the 1950s and uh, you can go to my lecture on postmodernism which are on youtube and you would find that uh, what was the scenario in the in the postmodern period, and uh, Beckett's artistic voice was a consciousness of experiencing existence by proxy. That is to say, experiencing always in terms of what was not there, of something or someone who is absent. So that's why Godot never comes. So Beckett's experience is all about existence by proxy, experiencing something. In terms of its absence right and uh, 
there are certain works by Beckett which would exemplify this existence by proxy Malloy, Malone dies, and then the unnameable. And these works exemplify this existence by proxy. So you can explore these works in more detail. Now, Beckett repeatedly used the phrase existence by proxy to express his sense of the unreality of life on the surface. And it was through invented surrogates that Beckett most memorably dramatized these feelings and ideas in fiction. So, uh, Waiting for Godot premiered in Paris in 1953 and uh, I have given the French title as well and it was published in 1956 for the first time. And there were three categories of interpretations of Waiting for Godot initially. And these three categories are the play, first one, the play as a Christian allegory and then the second category comes, the play depicts existential crisis and the third category says that the play is about unknowingness. Okay, so we would explore these three categories in my next lecture. Thanks for listening.